Nelson secured a victory for the British, which earned him a knighthood and promotion to Rear Admiral. A skilled self-publicist, he didn't waste any time writing his own account of the battle in the Times newspaper. Nelson's fame was spreading, and he was riding high on self-confidence. But five months after his first major victory, disaster struck when he lost his arm in yet another skirmish with the Spanish in Tenerife. That amputation was unfortunately performed. It took nine months for Nelson to recover. He had to be on, uh, on opium, and he was in tremendous pain. And at one point, he probably did feel that uh, things were going badly for him and that his naval career might be over. This was a big blow for Nelson. He loved writing and now struggled to put anything down in a letter. So bad was his loss of confidence that he even began to question his professional capabilities. But he needn't have worried. The whole episode just added to the public's infatuation with its top naval hero. He now had a, 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 a one-armed admiral, um, very distinctive, uh, always with his empty sleeve pinned across his tunic. Um, his white hair uh, was also very striking. And this all added uh, to the legend, uh, marked him out as being somebody different. It was an image that started to become more and more well-known. And of course, it's the image that has uh, forever been associated with Horatio Nelson. Nelson was also enjoying plenty of attention at home. His wife, Fanny, adored him, and by all accounts, they had a happy marriage. At one dinner party, Lady Spencer, a society hostess, even commented on how devoted Nelson seemed to be to his wife. I begged that he would bring her that day to dinner. He did so, and his attentions to her were those of a lover. He handed her to dinner and sat by her, apologizing to me by saying he was so little with her that he would not voluntarily lose an instant of her company. It wasn't long before Nelson was back at sea. War in Europe was still raging, and his rival, Napoleon, had his sights set on British trade interests. He had to be stopped. On the 1st of August, 1798, after months of cat and mouse maneuvers around the Mediterranean, Nelson finally came head to head with the French fleet a few miles off Alexandria, near the mouth of the Nile. The battle that followed was a turning point, annihilation on a scale never before seen in naval warfare. Nelson's objective in fighting naval battles uh, was not only to win, but was to destroy the enemy. The Battle of the Nile was fought at a very high tempo. It was fought, as all these battles were fought, at very short distances. You know, these are not long-range engagements. You have got ships firing at almost point-blank range, their solid shot, their grape shot, into their opponents. These are wooden ships, they're not armoured. They are packed with crews. They are fairly small ships, and yet they might have a crew of 800, maybe even 1,000. The carnage on board the ship uh, doesn't really bear thinking about. In the black of the night, terror and confusion reigned. The battle lasted for two nights and a day. One by one, the French ships were picked off or ran aground. Nelson was victorious. The nation was ecstatic. Nelson was now an international hero, and when he landed in Naples, he was treated like a king. And no one was more enthusiastic than the beautiful young wife of the British minister to Naples. Nelson was about to start a passionate and scandalous affair that was to destroy his marriage and threaten his naval career. The 40-year-old Horatio Nelson was already a celebrated naval hero. He had defeated the French and was set to become one of the world's leading military figures. But a visit to Naples soon after the Battle of the Nile marked a turning point in his life that would rock both his professional and private worlds. Among those who fated him as a homecoming hero were Sir William Hamilton, British minister to Naples, and his wife, Emma. Emma Hamilton was a blacksmith's daughter from the Wirral, 
who had risen through society via a series of relationships with influential suitors. Aged 26, she married Sir William. He was 61. Nelson was welcomed into the minister's home and was soon bowled over by Sir William's wife. Emma Hamilton nursed Nelson, she praised him, she gave Nelson all the things that Fanny, Nelson's wife, didn't give him. That was encouragement and support and saying what a wonderful person he really was to win these naval battles. What a marvellous man he was. Nelson was vain and Nelson responded to that. He fed off it. He needed it. Nelson and Emma began their passionate affair in 1799. The Admiral's lonely sea voyages were now punctuated by endless correspondence between the lovers. You fly up to my mind of my last breath. I can neither eat nor sleep for thinking of you. And all my fond heart hopes and wishes with the rest of my last breath happen it will be offered up in a prayer. Continue only to love your faithful Nelson as he loves his Emma. By the time Nelson returned to England later that year, Emma Hamilton was already pregnant with his child. He bought a house at Merton on the Thames and invited both Emma and her husband to live with him there. The three cohabited in an extraordinary ménage à trois. English society was appalled at the spectacle of the nation's hero carrying on so openly with another woman. Nelson's affair was to throw his private world into chaos and mark the start of a damaging public scandal. He upset the establishment on so many occasions because of his unconventional thinking, but the one thing that ostracised him was his open relationship with Emma. Nelson's wife, Fanny, could only sit by and watch as her husband built his new life. Once again, the couple dined with Lady Spencer, who was appalled by what she saw. Such a contrast I never beheld. After dinner, Lady Nelson peeled some walnuts and offered to him in a glass. As she handed it across the table, Nelson pushed it away from him, but so roughly that the glass broke against one of the dishes. There was awkward pause, and then Lady Nelson burst into tears. When Fanny wrote to her husband in 1800, do, my dear husband, let us live together, the letter was returned, marked, opened by mistake. 